Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Carter Foster. I, I recently, um, this is a session, first of all, on uh, the relevance of old masters in a, the high fueled world of contemporary art. Um, and uh, my name is Carter Foster. I just finished working at the Whitney Museum of Art for, of American Art for 11 years. Um, and I'm now uh, at the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin, Texas. And uh, I have with us Scott Rockoff, who is chief curator of the Whitney Museum, um, and Kevin Salatino, director of the Huntington Library in Pasadena, and Tom Campbell, director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, so um, the what and the why. Um, to me, this is, I certainly feel like old masters are very relevant. Um, and, but what I think is interesting um, about this topic, I was struck when these two works of art sold within two months of each other in 2013. Uh, the work on the left by Jean-Honoré Fragonard, a, a kind of work I consider an icon of Western art, um, selling for a large sum of money, over $25 million. Um, but uh, the, the work by Christopher Wool, Apocalypse Now, selling for a very similar sum uh, some uh, few weeks later. And I thought, what, is, what does this say about us as a culture right now? Um, is, does the monetary value of a work of art um, represent the cultural value. Um, if it doesn't, is there, what does the disparity mean? Um, and and what, is, what is interesting about that uh, as a subject? Um, just from my, my own work with contemporary artists um, and with living artists, um, the, the work of, of so-called old masters, which is an, a, a term that may be problematic these days, um, is certainly relevant. Um, every artist that I know that I worked with um, seems to have a deep interest in art history. They get ideas from history. Um, they explore that history. They're avid museum goers, um, and they love older art. Um, and uh, but I don't know that that's always the case with the audiences that rapidly consume contemporary art. And we've seen a huge uptake in the numbers of those audiences in the last 25 years. It seems to me the rise in the contemporary Kunsthalle. Even small cities in America now have contemporary art centers, some version of a MOCA, that's a, that seems to be a new phenomenon. And, and much of the dialogue in the media and the, the um, discussion in the media is around um, the uh, interest in contemporary art. Uh, we have the, the rise of the issue of the art star, which is sort of a, a relatively new thing. And I think it's interesting to discuss all of this in the context of of um, what museums do, what museums, um, museums that, that study older art, that, that store this, these cultural materials for all of us, um, you know, what, is it, what does it say? Um, and so this, is, this slide is meant to be a kind of um, jumping off point. I just wanna, just to, to convince people that, that it's certainly relevant to contemporary artists, I have a few slides. Um, this is uh, uh, the work um, on the right is by Dana Schutz, uh, a bathing figure. Um, I don't know if she's actually riffing on Rembrandt. The work on the left is by Rembrandt, but she's clearly interested in the subject of the bather, which is a long, um, well-worn subject in the history of art, do, doing her own thing with it, also in oil paint. Um, the work of John Curran, troping the technique of um, a German artist, Albrecht Altdorfer, from hundreds of years ago, um, also an artist very aware of, of technique and what that says. Um, even playing on the idea of mastery. Um, next slide, let's see. Uh, this is a very well-known piece on the, um, right by Bill Viola, the video artist, um, uh, riffing on a, a work by Pontormo, the, the uh, minor, mannerist painter. And finally, maybe the less obvious comparison, uh, the work of Laura Owens. This is for Scott, he's doing a Laura Owens exhibition. And Piero della Francesca, they, they look, these are the most different looking, but in fact, both of these artists are deeply interested in pictorial space. One is, is using, um, is, is playing against the flatness of the picture plane in an extreme version of perspective, and the other is playing within very narrow definitions of flatness um, to tease out you know, what it's like to use a two-dimensional surface to represent something. Um, all of these artists know their art history, um, but I think um, what I'd like to ask our panel is, um, you know, what does it mean when audiences seem perhaps less familiar with um, uh, the history that these artists are dealing with? And I think because Tom deals with an encyclopedic museum, I um, wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. I think the first question we need to address is, you know, so we're seeing the massive uh, massive influx of capital into the contemporary art market because of the global art market, because of the, um, the, the fairs, the global dealers, um, because of the fact it's now clearly being seen as an, as an opportunity for uh, speculation. Um, so there is this phenomenon of this, of this huge, huge prices. Um, 
and what is the impact of that on, on interest and old masters? Because it's clearly, it's driving media attention and audience attention. And I think it was, I was struck most recently visiting Berlin, uh, the contrast between the Bahnhof, uh, the modern art museum, jammed with people, and the Gemälde Gallery, which has one of the greatest collections of old masters in the world, and it was practically empty. It was a real contrast to our old master galleries at the Met, which perhaps because of their context, surrounded by all sorts of other collections, including 19th century and, and modern art, have a constant traffic. But it struck me that that really exemplified the challenge that, mo that museums now face. That the Gemälde Gallery, this great collection, but was absolutely unvisited because it was presenting old masters without any attempt to engage, to incite people's curiosity. Here they were as icons of the past. And I think it, it manifested to me the danger of, of this moment with all of this publicity and all this attention going, going towards contemporary. So yes, there's no question there's a, a drain, a, a, a challenge to our traditional, um, to our traditional remit to explore the art of the past. A separate question, of course, is are, are the old masters still relevant? But perhaps we come, come to that in a moment. Um, Kevin, you work at a, a, a place that also has, uh, you know, collects contemporary art, collects modern contemporary art, but has, has older art as well. Um, and you did an exhibition recently with the contemporary artist Alex Israel, where you in, injected the galleries with his work to, I think, the consternation of some of your longtime audience members. Um, I'm really interested in, in the responsibilities we have as museum, as curators and content makers of exhibitions, um, you know, how we make these dialogues happen across the centuries. Um, at, at a place like the Whitney or MoMA, um, you know, we, they don't collect that material, but one can easily imagine doing exhibitions that would include that material, but they're rarely done, uh, it seems like. I wonder um, if you, maybe you could talk about the Alex Israel show and what, um, happened with that? So uh, it was very interesting because um, our, many of our visitors, and, and bear in mind that the Huntington is a, is a place that's been around for a very long time. We're about to celebrate our 100th anniversary. Uh, and for many people, it's the one still spot, well, the one quiet place in, in, a, in a whirling universe, in a twittering world. And any change that's made is taken as a personal affront. Uh, and even if they've only ever been there once and don't realize that we're changing all the time. So I had equal parts love mail and hate mail. Um, and the hate mail was legally actionable in some instances. Um, I, I really I wanted to confront some of, some of the people that had written these, the, the, that had cut out the letters out of magazines and pasted them to like ransom notes. Um, and ask them if they, if they would actually say these things to my face. But what was interesting was that the hate mail was almost universally old media, and the love mail was almost universally social media. So, so what I set out to accomplish, which was to appeal to a different demographic, I felt was a success, uh, even if it might have alienated a relatively small group. Um, and, and also, if you were to do a Google search for Alex Israel, who is a kind of litmus test artist of the contemporary art market, um, if you were to do a Google search for Alex Israel Huntington, you got, I think it's maybe 600,000 uh, page views now, which for us is unprecedented. So it, it got the attention that I wanted to get, but it wasn't done just solely for attention. What I wanted to do, because my background is in old masters, my dissertation is on Fra Angelico, I mean, I'm immersed in the Renaissance. Um, what I wanted to do was to, to create a dialogue between the old and the new. I wanted people to look at the new through the lens of the old and look at the old through the lens of the new and experience them, experience them, experience them differently. I'm at an institution where we don't need to collect contemporary art because every other institution in Los Angeles, with the exception perhaps of the Getty, collects contemporary art. So it makes no sense for us. It, would, it, it makes no economic sense. It makes no, 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 no mission-based sense. So, but we have something there that no one else has, and that's a historic mansion that Mr. Huntington built in 1908. And it, it just feels different than, as anyone who's been in an historic mansion, it feels different than an, 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 a, a purpose-built museum. So you can conjure, the, the past is already conjured by displacing it with Alex's work, which I thought was beautiful and tasteful and, and merged seamlessly. Um, was shocking to certain people because they go to the Huntington to see Blue Boy. 
and suddenly there's an Alex Israel cell portrait, profile cell portrait within view of Blue Boy, him wearing his Dodger blue jacket, his homage, but for those who disliked it, an insult to the original Blue Boy, but again, trying to create this tension that drew as much attention to old masters. And when I saw the house filled with teenagers every day, I thought, I've succeeded in doing something, and especially when comments like one, uh, one docent mentioned to me that a mother and her 13-year-old daughter came in. The daughter pointed to our great sculpture uh, by Udon Diana, the Huntress, life-size sculpture, behind which was an Alex Israel uh, star-shaped flat in brilliant orange. So it made her pop like a comic book hero, but it really made you see her. And the daughter pointed to the sculpture and said to her mother, look, Ma, it's Katniss Everdeen. So if anyone has seen The Hunger Games, you know who that is. And that meant everything to me because it made that sculpture live for that young woman who I suspect would never have noticed it otherwise. So I felt it was a success. Um, what do you think, Scott, about this? <laughs> well, I have a, a few different um, thoughts in mind, but maybe thinking about your opening slide and also, Tom, some of the observations you put forward, I guess I would just like to ask that we don't um, get too hasty in conflating maybe the taste and the, the market uh, that our patron class is, yeah. is driving uh, versus the audience. And by that, I mean to say that um, the Louvre, you know, the Musée d'Orsay, the Met, these are among the most well-visited museums in the world, certainly far more visited than the museum at which I work, despite our, our new building. And so there is obviously a taste for uh, looking at the work of old masters. Also, interestingly, we had a show um, when we opened of a very generous gift, or just after we opened, from uh, two wonderful uh, collectors, Thea Westreich Wagner and Ethan Wagner, that included many of, um, in fact, a great painting by Christopher Wool with which you began the talk, uh, Jeff Kuhn, Cindy Sherman, a lot of stars of the market. It was a very unpopular show, frankly, in terms of numbers relative to other shows. So I don't think we all should fall into some trap where we assume um, that uh, because the market and because our patrons um, are interested in this, so goes the way of the world. In fact, probably most random people that you would approach and, and consider as potential museum goers may be less interested, in fact, in seeing that Christopher Wool than the Fragonard. So we, we all have to be cautious of that. And even though I work in a museum that's relatively narrow in its chronological purview, being 115 years, essentially, from 1900 to the present, teeny tiny compared to the thousands of years of history that that Tom is responsible for. I see that uh, if I were to raise money for a Jeff Kuhn show, it'd be much easier than for a Stuart Davis show. Um, so we're in a position now where I think we need to um, take a deep breath, actually, and look at our patrons maybe in the eye and try to figure out how to interest them in aspects of our program that are very um, essential to our uh, historical mandates as institutions to our visitors, whether they're uh, tourists or audience uh, members like Dana Schutz and Laura Owens, who we know love our history. And maybe uh, we as museum professionals, as, as we are of course interested in embracing the contemporary and all the ways that we've just discussed, um, not assume that um, we can't make a case for the old master, in my case, maybe I'm saying Stuart Davis is the old master in the Whitney's collection or, or Hopper, but I mean, we laugh and I would tell you that that's not what anyone on my board is collecting, really, or very a fewer, it's a, that's a, a shrinking segment versus the expanding segment of Chris Wool collectors. So I think it's an important um, distinction or kind of inflection point in the way that we think about this question. What do we think about the fact that artists like Jeff Koons, we can all name them, Cindy Sherman, um, are, you know, some of them collect what we call old masters. They're, they're all deeply engaged in history. They all have a deep knowledge, Tip Dunham, they all have a deep knowledge of this and, are, and, and want it. And it seems like the people that are consuming their work are, are less interested. You mentioned in, in Berlin that, that they weren't doing a good job of educating their audience. What do you think they were doing wrong? Um, and I think, I think that, that that's the critical question. Um, our mandate is to share art of the past with an audience and to in interest them. We're, we're fundamentally an educational institution. In the past, I mean, what, what are we talking about when we're talking about old masters? We're talking prim primarily, I guess, here about paintings made in Europe before 1900, um, which have, were very often highly prized objects when they were made and have stood the test of time in surviving. They've been collected, and there's a body of scholarship and understanding about them, a connoisseurship around them. So this is a, this is a body of work that is, in some respects, 
has been in the past fetishized and put on a pedestal. And I'd say that at the Met for the, and all other American museums, from the time of our founding in 1870 through till the late 20th century, this fetishized body of work attracted attention because it was people paid homage. You know, it was talked about in, in hushed tones, in, in, in the cocktail parties, it was referred to in schools. And then something happened in the late 20th century and, and in the present day. In part, that's the attention the media is paying to, con to contemporary art. And it's the accessibility of contemporary art. Because after all, even if it's totally incomprehensible, it's the art of our day. So if you, people kind of feel, well, it's part of the environment. And I think what has happened is that we increasingly historical art in an age of instant gratification of all of this information overload, historical art is harder to access. And the things that we used to be able to take for granted, that people would come into a gallery and be impressed by a Rembrandt, because it's a Rembrandt, people no longer have that cultural, that cachet is not so firmly tied to it. Yeah, and Rembrandt is perhaps not the best example because Rembrandt still attracts huge crowds. Still I mean, attracts there are, huge there are a crowds. Of stars, yeah. Rembrandt being one of them. Oh, thank you. I'm not. Yeah. All right. I, you know, I, th I, th I think, fair enough. okay, the reason I wonder. A guy with a sign saying, don't touch the microphone. <laughs> That's Alex. Thanks, Alex. But, but just these old, these old master names are less and less obscure. The subject matter is not readily understood by, as we are more and more successful in attracting um, non-Christian, non-Western audiences. The subject matter is more and more unfamiliar. But if you can get a kid um, in front of the Rembrandt that you showed and say, you know, what is this? And they, you know, they get past the subject. We're looking at a, na a naked lady. That, you know, a lot of old masters show naked women. It was a sort of soft porn of the time. And you can get, the, you can get the, the student to kind of, oh my God, that's what it's about. So I think our challenge is to, again, remove, remove the detritus of art history that we've increasingly put in the way of our visitors and allow our, allow our visitors to come face to face with objects without precon preconceptions and with fresh eyes. And I think that's contemporary art, we don't have to worry about it because of all of this, the media. But I think that's increasingly the challenge with old, older art, and especially old master paintings. Well, we also have, can you hear me? I feel like I'm not touching it. It's weird I'm not touching it. <laughs> um, we, we also have a, an advantage that our predecessors didn't have, which is the digital. And so digital is a dimension of everything in museums now, and the, the Met is a, is a trailblazer in many ways. Um, that, that depth, uh, because, because while, yes, we want to remove the detritus because it is distracting, all paraphrase um, sets aside the original, um, it's distracting and it, and it can be an impediment to appreciating something immediately before you. Um, I, I, it's hard to find the language to describe it, but we all know it, we've all been there, we've all experienced it in museums in front of a great work of art. The, but the digital, digital allows you when you're no longer there, even when you're there, um, because eventually we'll, everything will be, will be a, we'll, 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 we already have everything in our hand, but now the, the, the remote control of, of, of everyone today is your smartphone. But you can also go home and, 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 and dig down in a way that it would have been impossible or infinitely difficult in the past unless you lived in a major city and had access to a great library, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, that accessibility makes the potential for deep knowledge possible but it isn't necessary. So it is an advantage, and we simply have to make that overt, make it clear to our, our audiences. And our audiences, you know, something Scott earlier said, don't automatically assume that the public isn't interested in this, in the, in, in, in the old masters, because among the, 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 the top 10 most visited museums in the world, there are only two that show modern art, not contemporary, so MoMA is one of them, and the Musée d'Orsay, which really just goes up to post-impressionism, um, is the other one. The rest are, it's the, it's, it's the, um, Tate the, must be among them now. Tate's not, it is, no, Tate is not, wait, it is, it's Tate or maybe not. Anyway, but, but anyway, I, I, I understand two. that. So it's the, it's, it's the Louvre first at 8.6 million, and then it's the Vatican, and the Met is up there with 6.7 million. 
Tom uh, corrected me earlier. It's not 6.5, but 6.7. Um, <laughs> you're counting the cloisters, <laughs> right? And, um, <laughs> um, so that taste, is desire, is still there. But I do worry about its survival, um, precisely because of the distance that we see. And because the collecting class, although there are collectors, and the, and the collector of that Fragonard is someone who also collects later art, maybe not contemporary, but up to the 20th century. So there are collectors who, who cross the, the boundary of, of the, between I'm, the two. I'm really interested in the idea of, um, of, of doing exhibitions that combine um, the old and the new in a way that is not done a lot. Um, I think the Met's Unfinished show is a, an example of, of an idea that's a big idea that can be applied to um, art across centuries. And um, in, like the show that I always dreamed about doing was Rubens and de Kooning because de Kooning loved Rubens. And I think Rubens even inspired his comment that flesh was the reason oil painting was invented. And you know, when you have things like that, it, and you can imagine just doing a room at the Met or someplace where you have Rubens and de Kooning together in four paintings or something. And, but I, I wonder if, the, if partly the future of, of exhibitions and exhibition scholarship is to you know, tease out the roots of current art in older work. And I know that museums like Moe and the Whitney don't do this because their collecting doesn't go back that far. But Scott, can you see something like that happening in, in a place like the Whitney in the future? And you've worked with artists like Jeff Koons who obviously have a deep appreciation of, of this kind of material. And yeah, I, I could absolutely see that. And the, the Whitney has done a few examples of shows like that, like the Picasso and American Art right. Show, which was meant to pair artists like Jasper Johns or Roy Lichtenstein with Picasso. I mean, this was before my tenure. Um, and I think, you know, your idea of Rubens and de Kooning would be great. I guess my caution, as someone who loves art historical objects as, as much as contemporary ones, even though I find myself working in a more modern contemporary museum, is that I, I hope that we don't all have to believe that, that the contemporary artists will be entrusted to save the old masters in some way. That, that there, um, is there something a little condescending to imagine that Alex Israel, who knows very little about any of these artists, although... Not true, not true. He's incredibly smart about the old masters. Yeah, okay. He's <laughs> Smart, smart enough, but but I, and I, I like Alex. I know it. But but I mean, I'm saying the idea that this is going to be what will bring someone to appreciate uh, in the the contemporary era an object that has survived for hundreds of years of of scholarship, of connoisseurship, of um, a consensual value that may be eroding. You know, I think it's it's wonderful to do these kind of juxtapositions, but I would hope that we don't get to a point where the only way that we can look at our um, you know, South American uh, collection. I remember LACMA had, you know, Jorge Pardo come and redesign the, the galleries of um, some of their Mesoamerican objects. And I, I think that's great, it's interesting, but the notion that anything can only be interesting if it's seen through the lens of this moment of contemporary production, even though I should feel thrilled by that, I guess, because that's what I do. Uh, I hope we don't get there. I think we, again, maybe it's just like I was saying before about thinking about this difference between our patron classes and our actual audiences, uh, that we think too about where um, these tastes come from. You know, I mean, obviously this is part of a much broader social change that we haven't really touched on, which is the end of great books courses for obviously very good reasons as we explode the canon and we try to invite uh, more authors from all different parts of the world, more writers of color, more women, etc. But that the kind of education that would have made one appreciate the idea of buying uh, Dutch prints when they got out of Princeton 60 years ago is not the education they're receiving anymore. Uh, so if they're receiving a different education in college, for better or worse, it prepares them to be a different kind of collector, a different kind of art audience. And I think that it would be um, beneficial to kind of join up the conversation along these different lines, um, in, in my mind, and not to assume that it's going to be left to the lens of the modern to right. save the past in that, quite that way. Yes. I'm not, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, the contemporary, the juxtaposition of the contemporary with the historical is a great way, it's one strategy to open the eyes of a modern audience to the fact that all art was once contemporary. Um, so whether it's the National Gallery in London having the, the, whatever it's called, the Seeing Eye exhibitions, where they had artists like Lucian Freud making selections, whether it's uh, Hockney and others, whether it's um, projects like our own Unfinished that combine historical art and contemporary art, um, whether it's contemporary artists, yes, we, Carrie James Marshall is making a selection from our historical collections for his upcoming show. So that's it's a strategy. 
But I agree, we mustn't lose sight of the value of the in-depth connoisseur exhibition. But I think that, that also leads to another challenge that we have to be mindful of. Because when you, when you look back at the sort of the, the evolution of the big exhibition over the last 50 years, it's, okay, it's, a, it's an American phenomenon, post Second World War, it was a way for American museums to reach out to European peers, and the whole blockbuster cycle began, um, which first we looked at as a, a partly a business model, and then we all pulled away from that in the 80s and the 90s, kind of a little bit, um, because our art historians were using these, the opportunity to create these ever more specialist, really profound scholarly exhibitions. But we moved from broad survey exhibitions that introduced the generations of the 1970s and the 1980s to big, sweeping art history. And we got more and more and more granular. And I think that in doing that, we've kind of, we've lost our audience space. So as we think in the future about more connoisseurly, more focused historical shows, we've got to think about hard about how we go out and make them exciting, make them engaging, and get away from being overly focused. Because I think that, that is actually one of the challenges that is within our establishments at the moment. Our curators have become so specialist that they sometimes can't see beyond their own narrow area. Do you see doing so much broader sweep across centuries, um, art historically, that in a way that hasn't been done in recent decades? I, th I, th I think there is actually, I mean, it may be prohibitive in terms of insurance costs, but I think, you know, I so often I talk to some of my creators and they say, you know, what about a broader Venetian show? And they say, no, no, that was done in 1978. You know, we did the great, we did the great Impressionist show in 1992. You know, that's a, one or two generations ago. But I almost feel that that is what we need to do now. And in part, we can dig deep with our own collections, but we need to re-engage, to, to re-educate an audience about why these eras are so interesting. It's, you know, it's not just the dead white artist, it's not just the art of dead white men. All, what we were saying earlier, art is engaging in its own right for its creativity, for its, for its concepts, for, what it, for its emotions, but it's also the gateway drug to history. And, and I fundamentally believe that history is critical. You know, we have to understand about our past. We have to understand where we're coming from. So we have, you know, a moral obligation to use our collections to, to engage our visitors with history. Um, I use this term old master because it's a term I've used my whole life, really, or studying art. But I, as I was thinking about this panel, I was thinking, is that, you know, is that term valid anymore? The word master is very loaded these days for good reason. Um, and, and even in the, the sort of fetishizing of quality that it implies. It certainly is mostly a dead white male canon, let's face it, um, not, not totally, but it is. And you use this term exploding the canon. I mean, to what de degree is the interest in the now a reflection of a rejection of that um, to some extent? And is that part of the, you know, how do we face that issue? Um, what do you think? I don't think it is. I think we're all a little bit overstating this. I mean, Car uh, maybe I'm uh, becoming strangely the advocate for art history in a long review, but Carter, yeah. having worked with you on the opening show of the, um, uh, the New Whitney, we found that the pe things people most wanted to see were the old masters of our collection, um, whether that was Edward Hopper or Calder or um, George O'Keefe, there will put a woman in, in that category. Um, and we as curators were eager to explode the story, to include more artists of color, more uh, lesser known figures, but I don't think that that was us responding so much to the general demands of the audience as much as to maybe our own sense of a moral imperative that Tom, you were referring to, where we see that if we are going to make a museum that is more equitable, that is more inclusive, that it must tell broader stories. And then the question that I see moving forward at the Whitney with this display methodology is how are we gonna keep doing that thing that we believe so deeply in while actually satisfying an audience that frankly isn't there to see Christopher Wool or a Mabel Dwight print because we think that there's this unknown 
woman printmaker um, that we're all really excited about. So again, it's, it's, I think, Tom, what you said that was, struck me is, of course, that all artists were contemporary. And the Whitney, as a museum that was founded to support contemporary artists, thinks of this all the time. We used to talk about um, how could we show Hopper in some way that, that reignited the sense of discovery or contemporaneity that he was once a part of. And I think it will be an interesting um, challenge. And actually, maybe this will, is what will help save art history as museums of contemporary art age and their collections come to take on a much broader historical purview. So when MoMA and the Whitney, for example, were founded at a time that they had to become these sort of uh, vociferous advocates for the contemporary at a time when, let's say, the Met was not, their collections only covered 40, 50 years of art history. Now they cover 120, 130, 150 years of art history. So as these museums age, the same for the MoCAs uh, of the world, they are taking on within themselves a greater historical range. Certainly, it's, they're never going <laughs> to catch up to you know 2000 BC, or, but but that that what is the the fuse there? That now MoMA is no longer really a museum just for contemporary art, nor is the Whitney, but it's it's uh, from the 1880s to the present, let's say, at a place like MoMA. And if we look at that tension. Um, be, in, within the Whitney, between the people who want to see the Hoppers and our commitment to the art of this moment in the Whitney Biennial, or a Starry Night at MoMA, and all the curators' desire to be more contemporary, is there some productive um, kernel that lies at the heart of the kind of just genesis and lifespan of these, these institutions? I think it'd be a really interesting thing to think about. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was that interesting moment back in the 1940s when MoMA and the Whitney and the Met negotiated about what their various collecting remits were. And MoMA decided they would just be the art of the last 50 years. And they actually sold the Met 20 or 30 paintings that they had decided were no longer of relevant at that, at that moment. Um, the program only lasted for about 18 months because all three institutions rapidly realized that, their, that MoMA didn't want to be, it, of course it had to have earlier art. And if, you know, to, 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 to Scott's point, Starry Night, you know, it's, the Degas show, for example, I mean, is, is a huge trap, brings huge traffic. Gauguin brings huge traffic to MoMA. Um, in some of the early objects in MoMA's collection, let's say a, a Van Gogh portrait, early by which I mean the late 19th century, they're not that different in kind in terms of the experience they give you than a painting that's 300 years older than that. It's not like you're comparing apples and oranges or a video work and um, a photograph and an Egyptian sarcophagus. You're looking at two easel pictures that have a face on them. So if we know that within the life of MoMA and the audience for contemporary art, they can be interested in a Cezanne bather or you know, a Van Gogh portrait, why should we not assume that we can do that for a Titian? And, and what is that conversation? And how do we think about our audiences in that way at these different points in history? I think it would be you know, worth talking about. I, I also think that, that we, we're at a time where there's just a lot more to see. The menu is richer. So look, we haven't touched upon non-Western and art. That's not what this panel is about. But this, it is a kind of false dichotomy or competition between the old masters, which after all represent a particular period and a particular series of places, conjuries of places, um, and, and, and over a fairly long period of time. But we've left out whole continents. And the public has the opportunity now to see great shows of the arts of Africa. I mean, the, the Met is as an encyclopedic museum, and it basically an enlightened museum, was always established for that purpose. But the richness of those kinds of exhibitions, as opposed to, say, the classic Rembrandt show, which represents a kind of different way of looking at, or the Italian Renaissance. I mean, you think of the, the first great blockbuster, the Italian pictures in the 30s that went to London, for instance, enormous exhibition. Um, but the, the, there's, there, the, it, not only is there more to absorb, there's more so that, you know, you're just, there's this cacophony of things that, it's, that, 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 that is available to one, um, but just the richness of those offerings. And um, I would worry much more if no one was building a contemporary art museum, or an art museum for that matter, anywhere. It's gratifying to me that people care enough about the visual arts as they evolve, to, to, to build, one, build a museum in, uh, that, that they're not only seen as, as you know, engines of commerce, or, you know, but, but, but there's a real desire on the part of the public to, to, to uh, engage with art. That's gratifying. So I worry less, and I think that it's not such a big problem 
except that it's an area I particularly care about, and I worry about skills being lost. In a way, I almost worry about curatorial skills being lost more than the public losing interest. The, the curatorial skills is interesting to me because um, a lot of, uh, there's, there's, we've had in the last 20 years the rise in this, um, the, the curatorial studies, which wasn't, when I was you know, in graduate school, you studied art history. Um, you didn't study how to be a curator. You learned how to be a curator working at a museum. And, I, and I've, I've talked with, with younger colleagues who are, you know, they really are, they almost are willfully uninterested in older art, partly for the reasons of exploding the canon. They're more interested in critical theory. And there's nothing, it's not a judgment of that, it's just an observation that, is that a, you know, what does that say about us? Um, that, that we have those things that you can actually um, become a contemporary curator and in a sense ignore the art of the past, whereas again, the, the artists that they're, they're, they're working with aren't like that at all. Um, I think that's sort of an interesting phenomenon. Um, de de yeah, no, def definitely an issue. We, we work very closely with the Institute of Fine Arts. And in the last 10 years, we've seen an absolute shift in the nature of the student body. They all want to study modern art. They all want to st study the, sort of the political dimensions of modern art. And there's less and less, uh, there are fewer and fewer classes, firstly about historical art, and secondly, based on connoisseurship. So that unquestionably is something we will have to figure out ways to supplement um, because connoisseurship will always be a critical part of, st of the study of historical art because there is such a huge um, counterfeit market, I mean, forgery uh, market. Um, how do you think, it, this is for anybody, how, how do we think about the term connoisseurship in, um, in a contemporary context? Um, we, it was interesting when, when Scott and I were working on, on the shows that we did at the Whitney, the term connoisseurship would come up a lot in our, in our um, um, meetings. We were working on America is Hard to See. And um, I think we used it as a, you know, to kind of mean a, a kind of, you know, just really informed judgment. But it does mean something different when you're talking about connoisseurship of Raphael drawings. And, um, and how does it differ when you're using the term connoisseurship to art made now? I think that the fact that we, um, that painting is really a, a, has been a continuous, oil painting in particular has been a continuous medium for 500 years. You know, can you apply the same standards of connoisseurship to uh, a Dana Schutz painting as you can to a, a 19th century painting? I'd be interested to hear. If you did, probably no one would think it was very good. So no, I don't think you can. But, but I also uh, want to point out that, that, or I think you were hinting at that distinction between Tom, what was he was saying, which is a more specific definition of connoisseurship, I, I believe, is, you know, in terms of authenticating a work of art or its um, date, let's say, as opposed to what you were hinting at as a more general idea of being, um, you know, some, a, a judgment of quality. Are you or I, you know, professionally competent to judge the quality of Dana Schutz's work within her of or relative to any other painter? And I, I agree that as a kind of skill set, if, if that's the right term, um, that's not something that's being perpetuated really in uh, university settings right now. Um, and. I have to think about whether I think that's a, <laughs> a terrible thing, an okay thing. You know, what, what, what do we mean um, by... What, what, who is the dealer, the New York dealer, who was having Rothko's, I mean, who was having Rothko's painted on... Yeah, I mean, it, that demonstrates the, the lack of... I mean, it, connoisseurship, where you have people who've debated the, the origins of particular drawings by this artist or that artist, and whether it is, whether it isn't, you've got a whole, you know, generations of opinion that gives you something to work from, which you're, you're lacking in the contemporary field. Yeah, but Tom, also I would say to that is that to me that demonstrates less um, a, a available pool of, of connoisseurs or scholars to have that conversation than it did the kind of stranglehold of the market and the legal system on what that conversation might be. So all of the people who could have commented publicly on the record in a historical forum the way they might have debated once upon a time about this or that Raphael drawing were basically told by the institutions at which they worked, whether they were museums or universities, that they were not uh, able to exercise their judgment in any professional or public manner because um, they would be sued. And there was this huge question of the legal liability. And I work, you know, ahead of our conservation department is a brilliant woman called Man Carol Mancusian Garo. She, you know, conserved the Rothko Chapel. Uh, Jim Coddington at MoMA, you know, who worked on the Pollock Show. These are people who 
we are unfortunately unable to benefit from any recorded testimony, but I don't mean even in court, but let's say in a scholarly forum, from the people who are actually at the best um, point in their careers to give these opinions. And that to me is devastating and sad, and it will be a big loss to the field. And I think then we should be talking, if we want to talk about, you know, are, is this something that is or isn't being taught, or should we be talking about indemnification of right. expertise, or, okay. or who can create these kind of forums? The, the artist himself can deny it now, and it doesn't matter. Look at the Peter Doig case. <laughs> it's ridiculous Peter Doig case. Where the artists that they are saying, I didn't paint that, and furthermore, that's not how I spell my name. <laughs> We have about 10 minutes left, or a little less, and I know I think there'll be a lot of questions, so I want to open it up to the audience now. Um, and I don't know if we have microphones. Do we have microphones? Um, yes? Sure. I feel like listening to this, I know there are four different perspectives on what I've heard about four different perspectives on what one might want in, 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 in a museum to, to, for, the, for the museum goer. And it makes me wonder about. You must have real challenges, all of you, in dealing with your curators in terms of what they're interested in and what you might be interested in, and and they may and, and it may must be really hard to get modern and masters can curators talking to contemporary art curators because their perspective is so different. Met has about a hundred curators, um, all highly trained, all highly opinionated. Um, it can make for some very creative discussions as in the case, for example, of our unfinished exhibition at the Whitney now. Uh, it can certainly lead to all sorts of turf wars and um, in, uh, internal debates. But by and large, uh, it's a very, I think it's a very productive uh, divergence of opinions. Yes, Amy. I just wanted to make a comment about your collective statements about connoisseurship being somewhat lost or or muddled, or the threat of it being lost. But I would like to say that it is extremely alive and well in the marketplace. I would argue many of the oh, best minds of my generation yeah. were in the market rather yeah. than in the museum world. Um, we don't call we call it connoisseurship sometimes, but you call it the market. A market term is indexing, and you index for quality, as you would sit and debate Raphael drawings, and you index for commerciality. Now, sometimes they overlap nicely, even heavily. Sometimes they don't at all, but you are still a good, smart expert or specialist is still very capable and qualified to have that conversation about quality separate from commerciality. So I would say you all just need to, <laughs> you know, continue to train your teams to have that sense of um, discernment and, and sense of indexing, if you will. The auction houses for keeping um that kind of connoisseurship alive, which we greatly respect. Hear that? Every Thank God. Um, because it, even it died before I was in graduate school. It just it was just we dismissed it out of hand. It was just, it was a, it, it was, was was what dealers did, and it was irrelevant. But having said that, um, and I come out of the drawings world, where it's actually critical for a lot of reasons. Um, you can't argue about an artist uh, unless you can demonstrate that that works actually by that artist. Prove it. Um, but. In a brilliant book about 10 years ago, David Rosan wrote called Drawing Acts. He, he, he asks the question, but then what? You know the name of the artist. Great. Then what? What do we have to say about a drawing? And I, I recommend this book to all of you because no one, I think, has ever um, expressed the degree of profundity about the actually the, the, draw, the, 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 the mark and the meaning of the mark. Um, than David did with old master drawings, uh, and 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 it will transform your way of looking at art. So the question that's what the question we always ask in museums is, but then what for our audiences? What do we do? The market you can say, we have demonstrated this. Now we can we can we can guarantee that it's by this artist. It's authentic. It's sold, and then it leaves. You're not you you um, you fortunately or or not don't have to interpret it. We then we have the responsibility to interpret it, and that interpretation can be a heavy burden. You have 100 curators, I have six, and they don't get along at all. Um, and and, they're, and they're, but they, they engage in certain conversations, but they're never talking to each other for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Could I just also respond to you to this is that you know, one thing that I think is really important for me to say, but I agree, Amy, with what you're saying in general, but a lot of the things that were probably in the opening of the Whitney's you know, first installation, let's say some of the prints and stuff, you couldn't sell them at a day sale at Sotheby's. And um, I, you could argue that that's because they are of less value than something else, but I would just want to say that 
part of the way that we approached the kind of writing of history through the making of that exhibition and the responsibility that we have to our collection as a kind of historical repository, um, if we applied the same indexing that you said, we would not show quite a few of the things that are on the wall at the museum right now. And so as much as I value that notion of indexing, I wouldn't want it to be um, the only one that the museum used in its con consideration. bigger problem. So you have to have the skill set there. We just apply it for something different, but it's, it's like computational skills or something. You just need to have it. Yes, over there. Oh. <laughs> As part of the whole history Definitely. of those works. Absolutely. Uh, hi, I just want to make two comments. Taking on from Amy, However, I find ironic that one of the victims of the Nodler case is uh, uh, Domenico de Sole, who's the chairman of Sotheby's board, and he bought a fake Rothko. You would think he... Ha well, still, he was in the art. <laughs> still, I mean, that's still an art market, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can stay for that one, yeah. So we Five continue. <laughs> we'll be here. <laughs> and, and then about the museum and the balance you have to strike uh, uh, between educating the audience with what you think they should see and what they want to see. It sounds to me like you're facing the same dilemma that media and newspapers face, like the, the looking for eyeballs for advertising revenue and you know, your desire to educate the public and give them quality exhibitions and show art that deserves to be showed as much as the one that the people want to see more. So I don't know what's the balance. Well, it's, it's a tough one and, and we're in the business now of, I guess what you would call edutainment because we are in the business of entertainment and we do have to compete with, with other um, um, uh, forms of entertainment. However, our primary role is a combination of the two. And our primary role is education. Our secondary role is entertainment, so ed edutainment. Um, the advantage, I feel very fortunate because the advantage of a place like the Huntington is that people come for the gardens and then we suck them into the buildings. <laughs> Especially because it's always hot and the only air-conditioned buildings are the galleries, so we get them. It's not, that's, and that's an enviable position to be in. That's why but, Tom needs a door on Central Park. <laughs> I wanted to come back to this central question of how do you get people interested in the past? I mean, Tom, you pointed to art history as a road into appreciating history, and the past seems so distant and so foreign, I think, to much of our audience today. I was thinking, Carter, of a show you did at the Whitney a few years ago of art of the 19, American art of the 1930s. I'm sorry. Surreal. Exactly. Surreal. And yeah. which took a lot of artists who, whose names I didn't know or wasn't very familiar with. Well, and I didn't made, know. And it made them all fascinating. How did you get the idea for that? I mean, that was a really successful example of bringing the past It was a lot. inspired by Hopper's painting, Early Sunday Morning. And, and people always call Hopper a realist. And I think that's a real misnomer. Um, I think he has more affinity to surrealism. And the whole show, the kernel of the idea was around trying to make Early Sunday Morning look surreal. So I just developed paintings around that. And you know, we have rich holdings in that area. So it was a pleasure to pull out these artists you know, George Tooker's better known, but uh, many of them are really not well known, um, some of them, so, yeah. Kevin's point, I think, vid I mean, the, 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 the digital sphere gives us so, so many new ways to engage audiences. Um, and we, we've just done a project called The Artist Project, where we realized we had so many contemporary artists going to the Met for inspiration. And so we asked them to talk about works of art that inspired them. And it ranges from, you know, Jeff Koons talking about Greek sculptures to Wayne Thiebaud talking about Rosa Bonheur. Um, and, but it's fast, you know, you get these fascinating insights, not, which is another way of taking a contemporary audience back. Um, I, think, I think people are intrinsically interested in history. So it's not get, how do we get them interested in it, it's how do we, what is the device by which we convince them of what they already know? 
gateway drug to history. I mean, we, maybe the one seductive way visuals the are the way, you know, one way through the eyes. I think we have time all, those new, all those nude, uh -huh. you know, those old master nudes. Are the we way have to... time for one more question. Maybe Alan Winter mute back there, since I know. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Address the, the question itself. Uh, the question itself seems to be recognizing that there's a problem that our civilization doesn't recognize the art of the past when it, it's part of our civilization. And uh, it worries me that, that, that we're so focused now in modern modernity or modern art, we've lost our, have we lost the past? Well, I think you can take heart from the fact that museums like the Met and the Louvre and the British Museum are seeing ever larger audiences. Partly it's international tourism, but it, there is a market for it. People are, people are coming. Um, and it's partly driven by the contemporary art frisson. But I think if we're successful, we, we take them back, engage them with, other, 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 with, the, with the past. And, and while our numbers are nothing like your numbers, they're closer to a million, we've seen um, a spike of 20 to 25 percent in the past four years uh, in, in, in visitorship. And, and we've, raised our actual, we've raised our prices, and that hasn't kept people away. So I think there's a real need for it. Also, in a place like ours, there's what, uh, um, uh, what people call the, the drop shoulder moment. So millennials are the most distracted people alive now, according to statistics. And, and they long for places where they, they can actually breathe freely relax, find a kind of contemplative space. Uh, it's harder to do in a city like New York, though not the Met. In MoMA, you can't find any contemplation, but, um, <laughs> but not at the Met. Uh, it's big enough, you can absorb it. Uh, uh, but at a place like ours, we can, we can do that. The Whitney's now never, has ne has never saw numbers like you have now. No, it hasn't. But, but part of, I think, and I'm seeing the wrap-up sign waving, part of what's given the Whitney this new life, of course, is having a new building, is being downtown, is all these things, but it's also about bringing more of the works from the past, from the, the heart of the collection, and again, that's not a long ago past, but it's a longer past than maybe one who's used to seeing all the time there. So I'm, I'm not as worried about this, or the, the fear that I have is less about an audience and an appetite for history than maybe our profession and our patrons in, the, in that regard. But we should. Thank you very much for coming.